Fusion welding is an incredibly important industrial process for joining materials. It's used to build everything from chairs to skyscrapers. At its core, it's a really simple process. You bring two pieces of metal close together, you heat them up until they melt and fuse, and then you cool them down so that they solidify. Take a look around you, and I bet you'll see a lot of welds. Weld. 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 Today's welding techniques are very high tech, but the idea of welding isn't new. Because ancient civilizations lack the technology to directly make large metal objects, they use a technique called forge welding to join together smaller pieces of metal. In forge welding, two pieces of metal are brought into contact, heated up until they're white hot, and then hammered together. In the 1100s, new methods of mass producing metal were developed and welding became less important. If people wanted a metal object, they would melt the metal and make the object directly by casting it into a mold. It wasn't until World War II, when armies wanted to join steel plates for massive objects like airplanes and battleships, that welding became essential again. If you're designing a weld, there are several important parameters you have to keep in mind. The intensity of the heat source, which is defined as the power input per unit area. The heat input per unit length of the weld, which is related to the heat source intensity and how quickly you move the heat source. The method of shielding the weld from reactive gases in the atmosphere, like hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, that can affect the weld's strength. All of these variables are determined by the geometry of your weld and the type of materials you're trying to join. Going back to the first parameter, there are three general categories of heat sources that you should know about. In order of increasing intensity, they are gas sources that rely on the combustion of hydrocarbons, arc sources that generate a piping hot plasma above the metal, and high energy beam sources like electron beams and lasers. Electron beams and lasers can generate the nicest welds, but they require expensive equipment. So arc sources tend to give the best balance between quality and cost. Let's start by looking at a combustion welding technique that relies on the chemical reaction between acetylene and oxygen. Oxyacetylene welding relies on the energy released from the combustion of acetylene and oxygen into carbon dioxide and water. The chemical reaction follows two steps that can be seen in the flame itself. The first is the decomposition of acetylene and oxygen into carbon monoxide and hydrogen. This accounts for about two-thirds of the total heat released and occurs in this tiny cone where temperatures can reach 3,500 degrees Celsius. This larger light blue flame is the outer envelope and here the carbon monoxide and hydrogen from the first step react with oxygen from the air to form carbon dioxide and water. This secondary combustion plays the important role of protecting the weld since it sucks up all the oxygen from the environment. Now that we have an idea about the chemistry, let's weld along a seam. You start to weld by melting some of the materials you are trying to join into a liquid metal puddle called a weld pool. You then move the weld pole along the line that you want to join. As you move forward, the metal re-solidifies into a solid joint. This joint has three separate parts, the fusion zone, the heat affected zone, and the parent metal. An ideal weld is designed so that the fusion zone and the heat affected zone resemble the parent metal as closely as possible. This is because many engineering materials have a specifically designed microstructure. By heating the material up, allowing it to melt, we are allowing those atoms to move and the microstructure to change. And this can have a detrimental effect on the material's properties, like mechanical strength. The most industrially important welding techniques are the arc welding techniques that, like their name implies, rely on an electric arc to generate heat. In arc welding, you make a circuit so that current can flow between the welding electrode and your workpiece by grounding your workpiece and applying a potential to your electrode. The voltage between your workpiece and the electrode is normally around 10 volts, and the current is in the hundreds of amperes, so that the total power is on the order of thousands of watts. To give you some comparison, your average fluorescent light bulb consumes tens of watts. Most of this power is generated as heat in and around the arc. From looking at the concepts behind arc welding and oxy-fuel welding, I've given you a sense of how welding works. I hope you've learned something, and remember to keep an eye out for beautiful welds in the future. Dun, dun, dun. 
Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da